Welcome to Heritage. Take your Bibles, if you would, and go to John chapter number 9. What a great way just to uh, worship the Lord this morning. And uh, we are thankful that we can come together. Thank you for being here today. We welcome you again another Sunday here at Heritage. And I also want to take a moment to welcome those that are watching online. And uh, if you're traveling on vacation, I know several families mentioned to me that they'll be watching online or on vacation this week. So hello, and we're glad that you are uh, tuning in. Thank you for taking some time wherever you are. Let me encourage you, if you call Heritage your, your family, uh, do, uh, we want you to know that we miss you, we love you, and we're so thankful that uh, you're able to tune in by technology. There's some links on there that you can stay engaged, connected, give whatever you need to do. We encourage you to do that. If you're watching us online and you are new, you've never been here, we would personally invite you, I want to personally invite you to come and join us uh, on a Sunday. We're always here, always worshiping the Lord and having a good time. And, and so uh, let me encourage you, if you're watching online, if you've never been here, I would highly encourage you to come and make plans to be here and enjoy the experience in the room. We're so thankful that you are here today. We are in John chapter number nine, and uh, we are going to to uh, cover this morning 34 verses and um we are going to do that uh, in, an, in an expeditious way. I don't say that to scare you, uh, but if you have plans after this, I would go ahead and cancel them now. I'm just giving you fair warning. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, of course, we do have our, our international buffet after the service today, and we've got some great dishes. I walked by there, some great dishes. Thank you to those that made food, prepared food. We also supplemented some of that food. Not sure, not sure how much we would get, so we wanted to make sure we had enough food. So we've got uh, wonderful... Uh, uh, dishes from uh, American cuisine known as Lido's Pizza and Raising Cane's Chicken. So that'll be there as well. Uh, both breaded and non-breaded, all right, chicken there. We made sure we covered everybody. So there's a lot there. So make sure you stick around and, uh, and get some food. You say, I don't like people. That's okay, all right? You don't have to like people to eat, all right? Okay, we won't talk to you, all right? Just tell us you don't like people and we'll leave you alone. Uh, no, I'm just teasing, but we're so glad you, uh, please, let me encourage you. Take some time. If you've got five minutes, grab a plate of food. Don't leave here without grabbing some food, saying hello to some folks and connecting. This is an opportunity for us. We Sometimes like on Sunday mornings, it's like ships in the night. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, hey, how are you? Good to see you. All right, we'll see you next week. We have these uh, fellowship times afterwards because we want to connect together. And so let me really encourage you uh, as you are fellowshipping after the service. If there's someone that you don't know or haven't met, go up and say, hello, my name is, and uh, introduce yourself, and it'd be a great way for you to get connected uh, with somebody here in the church maybe you don't know. That's also a reason why we do uh, these type of fellowships from time to time, for you able to get connected uh, with somebody else. So we're in John chapter number nine, and uh, for, for sake of time and the length of the passage, usually we read the passage first and then jump in, but we'll walk through the passage together uh, this morning, and so we're going to... Uh, jump right into our big idea here this morning as we uh, focus in on John chapter 9. The big idea is this, very simply, that Jesus makes blind people see. This is the story of Jesus healing the blind man. It's an actual story. It actually happened. There was an actual man who Jesus healed in this particular chapter. All of chapter 9 is about Jesus healing the blind man. And this is an important big idea because Jesus makes blind people see. And you say, great, Pastor Steve, but why does it matter? And that's a good question for us to ask. Why? Here's the truth. Because everyone is born blind. Everybody is. Now, you, you might be sitting there going, I, I don't really uh, understand what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not picking up what you're putting down. What do you mean? I, I was not born blind, but uh, why would you say that everyone is born blind? It's important that you understand the big idea. Jesus heals blind people. Jesus makes blind people see. Why? Why does that matter for you? Because everyone is born blind. And maybe you are not born blind physically, but everybody is born blind spiritually. 
When we are entering into this world, the Bible says that we are lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And so being lost means that you are in darkness in your sin. As by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you are a student of the word of God, you will quickly discover that when Jesus or anyone talks about about sin, what's equated with sin is darkness. What's uh, equated with sin is lost. What's uh, equated with sin is blindness. So if everybody is a sinner, then beloved, everyone is born spiritually blind. What are you blind to? If everyone is uh, born blind, then we have, I'll give you three quick things for you just to understand that everyone is born blind. That means you are blind to the word of God. Those that are born, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are lost, who are in their sin, who don't have a relationship with Christ, are blinded to the truths of the word of God when they read it, when, they, when it's taught to them. They can't understand it because it is spiritually discerned. They are blinded to the word of God. Those that are spiritually blind are blind to the truth of the gospel. The gospel being that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was buried, and then on the third day, he rose again. This is the gospel. This is the good news, beloved. This is our only hope. This is why he is worthy of it all because he wasn't just a man who had a message that he duped some people into believing. He is the God-man. He is the Christ, the Savior, the one who came from heaven to earth to die on the cross and bear our sins and then take those sins and bury them in hell. But praise God, he rose again on the third day declaring that he is the king of kings and lord of lords and that is the gospel but those who don't know christ and those who are lost and those who are still in the darkness of their sin are blinded to the truth of the gospel they believe that jesus is a man who existed or just a good man but they do not understand the reason and the truth of why he came and his power in his resurrection those who are born blind are blind to the glory of christ when they look at christ when they understand Christ Jesus, they don't see him as the only savior. They don't accept him or believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. They consider him to be a good man, a good teacher, a moral guy, a good guy who did some good things, but they miss out on the glory and majesty that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the deity of Christ, Christology, the study that Jesus Christ was the incarnate God and the word became flesh and and dwelt among us in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God those who don't know Jesus Christ are blind to the glory of Jesus they don't believe sure they believe in a man named Jesus and sure they celebrate Christmas and they come to church on Easter but they don't believe in Christ as you need to believe on him for salvation they're trying to work their way to heaven they're trying to be moral and get to heaven they're trying to follow some religious system because they are blinded to the glorious truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. You see, everyone is born blind. But here's the good news, family. Jesus makes blind people see. <laughs> And so as we study out this story this morning, though we look at it as an actual story, there is great symbolism in this story. It's not symbolism that I have added in so that it makes it symbolic, but as you study it out, you will see that the way that Jesus approaches this physical blind man and the way that Jesus heals this physical blind man is the same way that Jesus approaches and heals those who are spiritually blind. And so we have to look at this story and understand this is the way that Jesus works in our life and the response 
from the blind man who now can see should be the same response that we have when Jesus opens our eyes to the truth of the word of God, to the truth of the gospel, and to the truth of the glory of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. We celebrate with this man that Jesus healed him physically, but I want you to make sure that as we go along in the next few moments that you see the progression that this man goes through because it's the same exact way that you and I need to respond to Jesus and respond to a society that rejects the truth of Jesus, that is blinded to the truth of the gospel, and it's the same way we need to live our lives. And so this morning, we look, first of all, at the healing of the blind man. In verse number one, the Bible says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a blind, a man blind from birth. I want you to notice that Jesus notices the blind man. In this society today, it would be very easy for Jesus or anybody really to pass by a man who was on the side of the road begging, who really had no status in society, who really had nothing to offer Jesus or his disciples. But yet we see that as Jesus is going about his business, as he's walking through, he doesn't miss the little people. He doesn't miss the rejected. He doesn't miss those who can offer him nothing. He notices the blind man. And I just want to remind you this morning that you may not be an important person in your own eyes or in this life, or someone may uh, look at you and you may have put a label on yourself that says, I'm just rejected, or I no no good, or I'm nobody, or I'm not really important. Can I remind you, my friend, that as Jesus looks down on this earth, he doesn't just see the important people. He doesn't just see the rich people. He doesn't just see the the people who have made it on this earth. Matter of fact, he sort of uh, tries to find some somebody that, that maybe is rejected and, and those that need some help and need some encouragement. I'm just so thankful this morning that Je- Jesus notices. He notices. I want you to know, beloved, this morning he notices where you are in your life. He notices that relationship. He notices that burden. He's walking by and he sees what you're going through. He has, he's not absent. He looks right at you and he sees your suffering. He sees your plight. I love the fact that as Jesus heals this man in a few verses later, he first notices this man. I want you to also notice that Jesus clarifies some assumptions. Verse two, he says, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is a, a, an assumption that the disciples make. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a societal, cultural assumption, and it's a religious assumption. Especially back then, anything that really happened in someone's life, it was sort of connected to some type of religious thing, that something happened because God was a certain way to you. And so the disciples are not out of line to ask this question, but they are making an assumption based upon cultural and religious religious teachings that if someone had an ailment or a or a uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, disease or some type of uh, handicap if you will that somehow either they sinned against God and God cursed them for that or their parents didn't do right by God and so God punished them by uh, causing something to happen in their children's lives it's a, an assumption and I just want to make sure we understand the the theology here because it's important to understand that suffering Suffering is a result of the presence of sin. The reason why there are things in this world that are not good is because of sin. When Adam sinned and now sin entered into the world, now it changed the utopian society that we had with God. We uh, lived in communion with the animals. Like Adam could walk up to a, a, a lion and pet it on the head and say, hey, come here, boy, come on, fetch right here. We can't do that anymore because of sin. I would not recommend that you do that when you go to the zoo next time. It, it, there was a time when there was no, there was no a pain or suffering because God made it perfect. But when sin entered into the world, the presence of sin now brings suffering. Any woman who has had a child is reminded of the presence of sin as they suffer through that labor pain. It wasn't supposed to be like that, ladies. 
But part of sin's presence brought about pain and suffering. And so we have to understand that there is evil in this world. There is debauchery in this world. There is sinful activity in this world. And there is suffering in this world because that's just the way it goes. Suffering is a part of life. This is why we reject the prosperity gospel that would say that if you follow Jesus and give enough money that all your pain and toil will go away. My friend, that is not the way that life works. As long as there is sin, here's the good news, there will be suffering. As long as there is sin, there'll be things that are not uh, what, what God's original utopian society had in it. We understand this. And so Jesus is talking to them and, and, and he, he responds to them in verse three and he says, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, generally, sin or suffering is the result of the presence of sin. But let me say this so you understand this theologically, that Individually, your suffering is not always the result of your sin. It's important to understand this. That when you suffer in your life, it is not God punishing you. Okay? And oftentimes, sometimes we are taught by good-hearted, well-meaning Christian leaders that say, man if, you, man, if you get away from God, you better watch out. Man, I'll tell you, 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 you go against this, you do this. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, if you don't do this, 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 you better watch out. He's going to get you. And so you, in your life, you try to do everything you can, and you live under this cloak of guilt, and you're like, okay, I better give. I better show up. I better sit in the front row. I better bring my Bible. I better forsake my, you know, my personal time because I got to do what God says. I don't want God to like, Right? And then what happens is we don't do something as a Christian. Maybe we, 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 you know, we like sin or we uh, say something we shouldn't or we act in a way we shouldn't or we get mad and all of a sudden, all right, we're driving down the road and we get a flat tire and we're like, oh, okay, God. All right, I see what you're doing here. Let me just say this, okay? Your flat tire may not have been the Lord, all right? It may have been that you were driving down the road and there was a nail on the ground, and your tire ran over it. And oftentimes as Christians, we live under this, this, this weight of guilt, thinking that every time I get a headache, God must be mad at me. And I wanna just help in your theology. That's not the way that God works. And we see the proof of it here, that he says, neither his parents sinned or he sinned. What he's saying is his blindness is not the result of his choices. But God gives us clarity here. He says this. He says in the verse three, he says, it was not this man that sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And here we see the beautiful providence and sovereignty of God. This is what Jesus is saying here, that he was afflicted so he could be healed. He was not afflicted because he sinned. He was afflicted. God specifically chose him to be born blind so that there would be a moment when he would be healed and that moment of healing would bring glory to God. Understand this, beloved. God is not trying to punish you. Sometimes God brings suffering into your life for his own glory. So that when he gets you through it, when he provides, when he sees you through, when he does something in a miracle, then you would say, that wasn't me, that was God. Let's give him the glory for what he has done. And maybe what you're going through right now is not because of your choices. Maybe it's because God chose you to go through that because he's bringing you to a place. Think about this, this man was born blind. We don't know how old he is. We find out later that he is of age, so he's gotta be at least a teenager, maybe in his 20s. You think about what this man had to go through for, let's say, 20 years or so. He sat in darkness. He couldn't see. He never saw a sunset or a sunrise. 
He never knew what colors were. And he sat there in a society that rejected people who were not all together. And he sat there and begged for years and years and years, not because he did something, but because God wanted to do something through him. And beloved, this morning, you may be going through something, not because you did something, but because God in his great sovereignty and his great providence from eternity past to eternity future has a purpose for that suffering. And though it may take 20 years or 15 years, here was the day when this man was healed that all of that suffering was for this moment right here. You see, it moves us from the shallow end of Christianity. It moves us from consumer Christianity to truly drawing close to God, saying, God, even if I have to suffer for your plan, I'm willing to trust you in my suffering because I know that this suffering will bring you glory and I don't want my life to be comfortable. I don't want my life to be easy. I don't want my life to be made in the shade with lemonade. I just want to glorify you so if this pain if this burden if this ailment if this thing in my life has to be here to bring you glory that I'm willing to suffer it moves us to understand the providence of God we see that he begins he's about to work but before he does he says in verse number four and five he says we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Before Jesus does this miraculous healing, we see that he involves his disciples in the work. We see he says, we must work the works. Verse number four. He doesn't say I must. He says we together must work that when we are seeing God work, that it's not just him working, but he involves us in God's work. This is why it's so beautiful to talk about what God is doing around the world and what God is doing here at Heritage. Why? Because God wants to involve us in the work. When we are involved in the work, there is unity in Christ's work. He says we must work the works of him. We together must work. There is urgency about Christ's work. He says while it is day. Why? The night comes when no man can work. This morning, church, we need to understand that there is an urgency about working for Christ as God has called you to this church. He's not called you to sit and just be comfortable and let everybody serve you. No, my friend, God is calling you to unite with him in the work of God and there's an urgency about it. Man, we've got to preach the gospel today. We've got to give today. We've got to serve today. We've got to get a small group today. We've got to help somebody out today. We've got to give of ourselves today. Why? The night comes when no man can work. There's a time coming God has called us as a church to be urgent about his work. And he involves you in it. You say, well, I don't have anything to give. Sure you do. You can give of your time. You can give of your talent and treasure, whatever gifts, whatever your personality is. Man, God wants to use you in his work. I promise you, beloved, he has not brought you to this church just to sit in the pew number seven, row, you know, 16, seat five, and just take it up and make sure you get yourself all nice and comfy in that little seat and get, get embedded down in there. No, God wants you to get up. Why? Because there's a world dying and going to hell. There is a world that is blind to the gospel, blind to the truth of Jesus, and we have to be urgent about getting the gospel out to them. So Christ invites us to his work there's an urgency and there's a focus. Verse number five, he says this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I want you to notice that Christ brings a focus that when we are involved in the work of God, we don't involve ourselves so that we can build our own little kingdom. Can I tell you this? Can I confess to you something? Okay. Confession time, all right. I promise you that I am not trying to build my own little kingdom. That's why we say it's God's church. He's doing a great job with it. You see, the focus of God's work and Christ's work, here it is, is Christ. That when we worship, we focus on him. When we preach, we lift up Christ. 
When we are together in groups, we talk about Christ. When we are serving the Lord, we are focused on sharing his gospel. When we give, we give to the work of Christ. Why? Because he is the light of the world. No man, no personality, no church program will transform someone's life. Only Christ can bring light into darkness. And so as he involves us in his work, we must be unified. We must be urgent. We must be focused on him. It's a privilege to be invited into God's work, to be able to co-labor with him. And then we see in verse number six and seven, Jesus heals the blind man. He says this, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Interesting little thought there. He gave a part of himself to bring the healing. Some of you already, some of you got that, right? Right, you connected that. He gave part of himself. One day he'll give all of himself in just a few months from now so that all of us can be healed. He gave a little bit now so one could be healed. But when he died on that cross, he gave all so that all could be healed. He spit on the ground and he made some mud. And then he says, then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sense. So he went and washed and came back seeing. There's the miracle. The blind man was healed. Now, the rest of the verses, some of you are thinking, wow, we, man, like, we've got, like, uh, Pastor, we've got 28 more verses to get through. So can you just, like, do a summary? Yeah, absolutely, sure. Just summarize. The miracle's over. Let's just do a little summary here, right? Okay. I, I want you to understand something before we walk through the rest of the passage, and that is this, that the man, this is very important to understand, the man was not healed because of the mud or of because of the water. Understand, he was healed because he followed what Jesus said to do. That's very important. If, you have a, if you're suffering with something, don't ask your spouse to spit on the ground and get mud. There is no magic mud. Do not wipe your eyes with mud and jump in your swimming pool, okay? <laughs> it's not going to work, all right? So the symbolism here is this, is that what the man did did not heal him in itself. The pool wasn't magical. The mud was not some magical thing. It was how he followed what Jesus said. And here's the application very quickly here to, to this point, is this, I must follow what Jesus says if I want to see. See, this morning, if you are spiritually blind, you've never accepted Christ as your savior, if you want to see because Jesus makes blind people see, then my friend, all you have to do is follow what Jesus says to do. You say, well, what does he say to do? The Bible says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And oftentimes what we do is we try to figure out what we think we should do to be saved. What we think we ought to do to be, to be able to see. But this morning we see the gospel is simply you responding to what Jesus says to do is to call upon him and ask him to be your savior, to believe he is the only savior and to put your faith and trust in him. And so we see Jesus heals the blind man. Now I want you to notice in the next part, the response to the blind man. So he gets healed, right? Now this guy has, he's a, he's a staple in the town and he, now he has been blind. A lot of people know that. And now he comes back seeing and we see the response. Look at verse number eight. It says this, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? The next verse goes on and says this, verse nine. Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. This is like a comedy of errors here. I wish I could be in this group. So this guy, he comes back. And I mean, you got to imagine, this is like the greatest moment of his life. I mean, he was blind, and he comes back seeing, and he walks back into the town, and he's like, hey, I can see. And they're like, who, who are you? I'm the guy, I'm the beggar, right? We never know what the blind man's name is, right? He's, I'm the beggar. I'm the blind beggar. No, you're not. You don't look like him. Wait, come here, come here, come here. Hey, who is this guy? Anybody seen this guy? Are you the, he looks like the blind beggar. He might be the, turn around. 
Yeah, I can see the resemblance. Hold on. Yeah, you smell. Yeah, we, I remember smelling that smell when I walked by you a couple times. You think he, I don't think he, he looks like the guy. And he, he literally responds, he goes, I'm the guy. I'm the man. Verse number 10. He says this. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And this is where this blind man begins to share his testimony now that he is healed. And I don't want you to miss his response because his responses are very similar to what our responses need to be. He goes on verse number 11. He says this. He says, he answered, the man called Jesus. Notice he doesn't really know who he is. He's like, I, the man that I think we're, the, the guy who's Jesus, the one who's like making a bunch of ruckus around the temple and stuff. Yeah, that guy. Jesus made mud and anointed his, my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. I mean, he's excited. I mean, he's like, he gives detail. He talks about the mud, talks about the, the, the pool. The next verse goes on, verse number 12. And he says this. They said to him, well, where is he? He said, I do not know. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me, you expect us to believe that all of a sudden a guy named Jesus came by and rubbed mud on your eyes? He spit in your eye. He spit? and put mud, and told you to walk, and now you can see, well, where is he? Oh, I don't know where he's at. Notice here that these neighbors don't understand what's happening. Can I tell you this, beloved, that when Jesus opens your eyes, and you begin to testify of what Jesus has done in your life, there will be some people real close to you who won't understand what you're talking about. You're going to come in, man. You're like, man, I, man I, I found Christ and I'm following Christ and I'm encouraged to follow Christ. And they're like, why do you go to church like every Sunday? <laughs> well, because I mean, I want to grow in Christ. I mean, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, come on. It's like sort of like, feels like a little cultish, you know what I mean? And you're like, no, but you don't understand. I mean, like, listen, man, my life was like this. And then I came and I heard about Christ and man, I'm growing in the grace of God and I got saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, come on. I mean, like, I mean, we all know who you used to be. <laughs> Okay. And I don't know if you, this is a little, little fad here. Notice what he's going through here. He's going through the same thing that some of you have gone through in your family. It's like that Thanksgiving dinner when you like, you know, sort of pipe up and, and you've been following Christ and, and nobody prays in your family. And you're like, mm, do you mind if we say and thank the Lord for the food? And they're like, sure, cold, cold, oh, my brain, what was this guy? You hear what he wants to pray? <laughs> I've heard him say God's name, but not in that way. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> right? And oftentimes what happens is this. As you follow Christ and you testify of what Christ has done in your life, beloved, there will be people who would just won't understand. They're just not gonna get it. They're gonna think that, can I say this? They're going to think that you're a little, you know, right? And it's going to be discouraging. And this man, though, he doesn't get discouraged. He keeps going right on. Look at verse number 13. It says this. It says, they brought to the, uh, brought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who uh, had formerly been born blind. Verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Now this is a problem. Okay, because you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work. You're not supposed to make mud. You're not supposed to go dip in the, in the pool. This is against Jewish uh, teaching. And so not only did Jesus heal this man, and a lot of people don't believe him, but now he broke the law. Look at the, verse number 15. says this. Verse 15, so the Pharisees, these were the religious guys. So he goes from his neighbors to now the religious people, right? So his neighbors are like, mm, yeah, we're not sure if we can believe you. The Pharisees say, so the Pharisees said again, asked him, how has he received his sight? And he said to them, he put mud on, on my eyes. Notice he shortens, the, he's, he might be getting a little frustrated here. He shortens the details this time, right? He put mud on my eyes and I wash and I see, okay? He's getting to like, come on guys. Like I'm the blind man, I was blind. Why are we talking about that? I was blind. And I washed and I see. Look at the next verse, verse 16. It says this. It says, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. This is talking about Jesus. For he does not keep the Sabbath. I'll tell you here, this is, this is just like the religious people to be on cue right here. A miracle has happened. God has miraculously made a blind man from birth see. And all the religious people can do is talk about their traditions that are messed up. Can I tell you this? I just, I just want to say this, okay, as a, as a sort of a side note, okay? Religion is very comfortable. 
some of you think about, I want you to think about like your favorite, like when you go home today and you, you know, you get done with the day and you want to sit down and relax and you've got, you know, your diet Coke, whatever you drink, right? Okay. <laughs> whatever, right? Between you and the Lord. Amen. <laughs> okay. And, and you got your thing, you're relaxing, right? And some of you, some of you go and reach for, you go in that closet and you'll reach for that favorite sweatshirt. You know what I'm talking about? right? You know that one that you've had like since high school, you know, that's like your favorite. It's a little ripped. It's got a couple mustard stains on it. You know, your ex-ex-ex boyfriend or girlfriend wore it a couple times, you know, and, and it's just sort of, but man, it, it, when you put that on, you know what I'm talking about? It feels good, right? It just like is comfortable. You just like love wearing it, even though it looks bad and you would never go out in public in it. It's just comfortable. You know, a lot of times that's what religion is like, Religion is this thing that we're used to. Christianity is the opposite of the warm sweatshirt. Christianity is messy. Christianity invites people to be a part of what God is doing when they don't have it all together. Christianity accepts people where they are and grows in grace with them. But isn't it like the religious people? To come in, this man says, man, I was blind, but now I see. But mm -mm, it was the wrong day for him to heal you. Can I tell you, some of you need to break free from the comfortable sweater of religion and stop waiting for someone to give you another list of rules to follow and start living in the grace of God and realize that we're all in different places. We all have different problems. We all are trying to figure it out. There's nobody perfect. Let he who has sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And sometimes we'll have somebody come in and maybe they don't look or sound or they don't know the songs or they don't look like this. How dare we forget where we were when Jesus found us that we would put our nose down at somebody who doesn't have it all together. I remember when I, I'm gone. I tried to be short. Here we go. I'm going long now. I remember when we were when we were remodeling this auditorium here, and we we were moving things out. and And I remember there was a comment made, and I said we talked about having. I said, "Man, we're gonna have." Pastor, I said, "We're gonna have like you know stuff in here, man. Banquets in here, man. It's gonna be awesome, right?" And somebody sort of just piped up, and they said, eh, "They're not here today." And they said, "They said." They said, well, what if, what if somebody spills something on the carpet? <sighs> Beloved, I'm telling you, I was growing in God's grace in that moment. I said, you mean like, like if a teenager spills a Coke because he's kneeling down to pray and accept Christ as his savior? Like that, you mean? I actually said that. It was in a business meeting. I said, like that? I'm growing in God's grace. I've, I've grown in the grace of God the last couple of years. I said, I said, I said, I will personally pay for the stain to be removed if that happens. Look, we got to realize something here. Our world is not looking for some tight knit religious system to follow. They're looking for hope. They woke up this morning and they didn't ask, what should I, what should I wear to church today that will, I'll feel accepted? They didn't wake up this morning and wonder how they can figure out how big the tabernacle was. They woke up this morning blind and broken and hurting. Oh, and they may have a big house and a nice car, but inside they are miserable because that life has brought them nothing but heartache and sorrow and pain. And they are not fulfilled, though they keep working, and they're they're not. And so let them come in. I don't. It, it doesn't matter where they come from, or the color of their skin, or or what they identify. Let them come in, and let them hear about the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. And may we be willing to offer them a seat. May we be willing to get them a coffee and say, come sit with me. May we be willing to go out and say, let me find the most messed up, rejected person I know in my circle of friends. I'm going to invite that guy to church. And respond, not in a religious way, but in a way that Jesus responded to you when you needed hope. And invite him in. 
All right, back to the message. That was extra. That was free today. A little extra. You're welcome. You're welcome. Let me just say this. We see in verse number, what are we, 16? It says, and there was a last part, and there was a division among them. They weren't sure who Jesus was. Verse 17. It says, so they said, they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he had opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. I won't, don't miss this. The first time they asked the blind man, he said, I think he's a man called Jesus. But now he's starting to grow. And he doesn't say, there's a man named Jesus. He says, no, 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 no. He's a prophet. I love that we see this young, this young believer growing quickly in the grace of God. And he's like, no, no, no. He's not just a man called Jesus anymore. He's the prophet. Verse 18, he says this. Verse 18 says, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, okay, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. So now nobody believes this guy, right? Like I could see, and the neighbors are like, nah, I don't know, man. Like, come on, let's bring in the religious people. And the religious people say, well, we would believe it if it wasn't a healing on the Sabbath because our law says, and you have to sit here, right? And those, those are, we're religious people. And so uh, we would believe that God did it, but God didn't follow our little system. So therefore we cannot accept the healing. We don't believe that you were blind. I was blind. Okay, like, all right, man, this guy's, I mean, if you're going to be, if you're going to be like, you know, adamant about it, where's your parents? So they call his parents. <laughs> and the Jew, uh, verse, uh, was it 19? He says this, and asks them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20, he says this, his parents answered, we know that this is our son. This is, yes, it is. And that he was born blind. So, yep, this is our son. And he was born blind. Verse number 21. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. And they go, ask him. <laughs> like, I don't know why you, you drug us. I mean, we're just relaxing at home. You know? They said, he is of age. Why are you talking to me? You know what I mean? Go ask him. He will speak for himself. Verse 22 says this. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. I want you to notice here that the neighbors had a hard time believing. The religious refused to believe. But I want you to notice that the parents were ashamed to say they believed. They knew what happened. They knew what Jesus had done, but they feared man. So many of us, God has positioned us for it to be a great testimony, but we're so afraid of what our coworker will say. We're so afraid of what that friend will say if we share Christ. We're so afraid to be rejected. We're so afraid to not get invited. We're so afraid to be looked at in a different way. And so we, we are quiet, though we know the truth. Can I just say a side note? Okay. This is my second free thing for you today. Getting free stuff all the time, all the time. I thought it was interesting, the fact that this man was begging on the side of the road when he had parents just down the street. I thought that was interesting. And I thought to myself, I wonder if his parents were ashamed of him. I mean, you could probably make a case because they didn't want to, they didn't want to celebrate with him in his greatest moment. So why would they be proud of him when he's a blind beggar? Can I just, can I just help you, mom and dad, okay? Your children may not be exactly what you want them to be. They may not be where you think they ought to be. Can I, can I, can I encourage you? Don't kick them down the street and be ashamed of them. You love them. 
The most optimal environment for change is acceptance. And so often in our lives, we feel as though the choices of our children cannot be a part of our own lives. Can I tell you, can I encourage you, love your children where they are, no matter what they do, no matter what they've done, love them. Why? Because we don't love them because they're perfect. We love them because Christ loves us. And let me encourage you not to be ashamed of your children, but to be there for them, to help them, to guide them, to direct them in this confusing world. So we see that Jesus, or the, the blind man says, okay, his parents say, no, verse number 23 says this, therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him, verse number 24, it goes on. So, uh, so for the second time, they, they called the man who had uh, been blind and said to him, give glory to God. But they're not asking him to give glory to God in praise like Becky asked you to do on Sunday morning, okay? What he's saying is, what they're saying is, come on, tell the truth. Tell the truth now. You, there's no way that you were blind and now you see. Tell the truth. And he says this, he says, we know that this man is a sinner, verse 25. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I know, that I thought I was blind, and now I see. <laughs> I love this, I love it. This is the beauty of Christianity. This man walks in. And he said, look, my neighbors, man, are rejecting me. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I thought it would be different. The religious people, they're smarter than me. They know all the Bible and all this stuff. And my parents are ashamed of me. But I'll tell you this, even though I should denounce Christ, even though I should be ashamed, even though I should like lie and say, I don't know how it happened. I cannot deny what Christ has done for me. He says, I don't know a lot of things about the Bible. I don't know a lot of things about religion. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And I love the fact that he simply responds to them and says, I don't, know, I don't know a lot of things. I just know what Christ has done for me. Can I tell you this morning, you don't have to know the whole Bible. You just have to rest in the truth of what Christ has done for you. Why? Because his confidence was in Jesus, not in his own efforts. You notice he doesn't say, one thing I know is that I went down to the pool. He doesn't say that. He says, one thing I know is he put mud on my eyes. He doesn't say that. And oftentimes our confidence is in our own efforts. Oh, I know that I'm saved because I, I, I prayed. I remember I prayed that just like he said and I trusted, I prayed just like he said to do. And my confidence in, well, I go to church. My friend, listen, his confidence wasn't what Jesus said for him to do. He says, all I know is I was blind and now I see and that's all God's work, not my work. And we can rest in the confidence of God's work. And I want you to see very quickly the last part, the boldness of the blind man. He questions the religious, verses 26 through 29. And then verses 30 through 34, he finally concludes. And he says this. He says, verse 30, the man answered, why, this is amazing. This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. There's a lot of irony right there because now the whole time they've been trying to convince him that he wasn't born blind and now they admit that he was born blind in order to put him down. Notice they, they use his weakness against him. How dare you talk to us? Who are you? You were born blind. And he's like, I know I was. I've been trying to tell you that for the last 14 verses. <laughs> I'm glad you finally, we finally agreed on something here. And that you would teach us. And they cast him out. They cast him out. What's the, what's the application? is this, if, if Jesus has allowed you to see, 
if your confidence is in what he's done, then I should declare to others what Jesus did for me. That my life's purpose is to declare to anyone around me, hey, I don't know if you know this or not, I was blind, but now I see. And let me tell you about the man who did it for me. We see a beautiful symbolism in the way that we ought to live our lives, declaring what Christ has done for us. I'd like to take just a moment here and just share with you this morning, those that maybe have never accepted Christ as your savior. Can I talk to you specifically? The Bible says that you are blind to the truth of God. You're blind to the gospel. But Jesus makes blind people see. And if you will trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, not just believe he exists, but truly believe that he is the Savior and that there is no other way to get to heaven and you will forsake any other efforts to try to get yourself to God. You say, I'm not gonna believe in my good works, my religion. I'm gonna trust solely in Christ. The Bible says that your blind eyes will be able to see and he will save you. And I invite you this morning to respond to Christ. Allow him to change you from being blind to seeing. A few decisions we can make this morning and we're done. First of all, here on Learn to Live, we see number one, that maybe your decision is to involve yourself in the work of God. Be urgent. I'm gonna get involved now. I'm gonna serve now. Maybe you grab that connect card in the seat back in front of you and say, man, I'm, I'm signing up for volunteering. I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know how it's gonna work out, but I, I don't wanna sit and be comfortable. I wanna get involved in God's work. Maybe for some of you, you need to glorify God in your suffering. And maybe you saw your suffering as a penalty from God, but maybe now you would see it as a purpose from God that God is working to bring glory out of that pain. And for some, maybe you ought to support the work of God through giving. As we see and we, we say, you know what, man, I can't maybe go around the world, but I can help support. And maybe you would start giving to the Lord financially so that other people who are blind can see both here and around the world. And for some, maybe you would believe and accept Christ as your Savior. I invite you to make a decision this morning as we close. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us and helping us. God, guide us and direct us into the truths of your word this morning.